بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم I think we will start now the lecture uh, our talk today as you can see about the keratoplasty indication and complication actually it's an, a huge topic it's a long topic it's a lot of procedure every procedure it needs at least one hour I will try to summarize as much as I can I will concentrate on the very important uh, practical parts uh, of each procedure. And if any question later, we can uh, uh, share the answer. Uh, we will start by the history uh, overview of keratoplasty in general. Uh, in, uh, the scientific sense, the original uh, concepts of the corneal uh, surgery dates back to the Greek physician Galen, and this is, was uh, before the crest. Uh, on the 17th century, the first description of keratoprosthesis is attributed to the French uh, surgeon, Guillaume Biller. During the French Revolution in 1789, he published the first monograph dedicated to ophthalmology. In this work, he suggested that a transparent material could be used to replace an opaque cornea in order to restore the vision. In 18th century, 1813, uh, Carol Himley was the first to suggest that transplanted corneas from other animals could be used to replace opaque animal cornea. However, his students, Franz Riesinger, who initiated experimental animal corneal transplantation in 1818. He coined the term keratoblasty in 1824, suggested the use of animal tissue to replace corneas. Subsequently, uh, Wilma Thorne created the term corneal transplant, and three years later, uh, Samuel Piger reported successful corneal transplantation in Gazelle. The first recorded therapeutic corneal xenograft on a human was reported shortly thereafter, but unsurprisingly, this was unsuccessful. The uh, true scientific and surgical experimentation in this field did not begin until the 19th century. Further progress in corneal transplantation was significantly hindered by limited understanding of antiseptics, principles, anesthesiology, surgical techniques, and immunology. The first successful human corneal transplant was performed by Edward Zerm on 7th December 1905. Since that first successful corneal transplant, innumerable ophthalmologists have contributed to the development and refinement of the corneal transplantation, aided by development of the surgical microscopes, refined suture material, the development of eye banks, and the introduction of the corticosteroids. The advancement technology in the corneal transplantation and donation techniques in form of the eye banks uh, become uh, so advanced in the 20th century, and this led to more precise cutting, less endothelial damage, more optical and refractive outcome, less complications, and as we know, the latest advancement technology is using the femtosecond assisted uh, assistance in the keratoplasty. All of us know the anatomy of the cornea. Um, as we know, it's an, um, uh, uh, composed of five layers. Nowadays, they go for the sixth layer, which is dual layer, and every layer, uh, every procedure, we are removing some tissues, and we will discuss it this uh, in the next uh, uh, slides. Types of the keratoplasties, which is uh, common, is a penetrating keratoplasty. We are removing the whole layers of the cornea, including the endothelium, and replacing it by full uh, donor uh, uh, corneal layers. Anterior lamellar keratoplasty, either deep or superficial, we are removing uh, 
we are saving the host or the patient endothelium and decimates membrane plus minus some stroma and we are replacing the stroma by uh, a donor uh, patient uh, cornea decimates stripping endothelial uh, automated endothelial dystrophy uh, I'm sorry, decimates, uh, uh, decimates stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty we are removing the posterior part of the host cornea in form of decimates membrane and endothelium and we are replacing it by a donor posterior uh, uh, part of the cornea including the endothelium stroma plus minus uh, endothelium uh, decimates membrane plus minus stroma in the dimic just we are replacing the posterior part of the host by a decimates membrane and endothelium of the donor keratoprosthesis we, this is an artificial lens it's replaced the whole layers of the cornea and it's hanged in the uh, uh, tissue uh, and this is in a special situation we'll t discuss it uh, later and this is another diagram how to divide the anterior uh, keratoblastis or the posterior keratoblastis we'll talk about the penetrating keratoplasty uh, definition of penetrating keratoplasty is in a full thickness transplantation of the donor cornea including the decimates membrane and the endothelium replacing the whole recipient corneal layer the types of the corneal grafts xenograft xenograft means that we are taking a graft tissue from a species different totally from the other species that means we are taking it from animal and we putting it in the human and this is because of the immunity it's not successful and nobody is doing it allograft or homograft and this is the most common we are using it now it's a transplantation of living cells tissues or organs to a recipient from a genetically non-identical donor of the same species that means we are taking a corneal graft from one person and we put it in another person the autograft is the transplantation of the organ tissues or even particular proteins from one part of the body to another uh, part in the same person in our case we are taking uh, uh, cornea from the right eye for example of one patient and put it in his left eye the indication of the pkp or uh, penetrating keratoplasty uh, could be related to an optical causes or therapeutic causes or tectonic causes the therapeutic uh, causes that mean we are taking on a source of infection and we are replacing uh, uh, replacing it by another a new graft tectonic which is mean there is a melting or perforation as we are replacing that uh, uh, perforation by a tectonic or patch graft uh, we will concentrate on the optical causes the most common causes for penetrating keratoblastis keratoconus this is the most common nowadays repeated graft there is an failures so we'll go for to repeat it so the fake polus keratopathy uh, the pseudophagic polus keratopathy it's an, a disease of the endothelium nowadays you are going to the DASIC in a state of uh, full thickness penetrating keratoplasty corneal dystrophies and degenerations fox endothelial dystrophies is the same principle of pseudophagic polus keratopathy corneal endothelial damage by any reason also we are going to DASIC if and, uh, and the anatomy allows us corneal opacities congenital corneal opacities like congenital glaucoma or uh, anterior segment dysgenesis now we'll talk about the briefly about the complication of penetrating keratoplasty uh, we can divide it to the intra operative complication and this is could be related to technical issue uh, like improper trephination and 
if donor potum is smaller than the recipient one, we will end it by gabbing, hyperopia, or collapse of the trabecular meshwork, and this will lead to the secondary glaucoma. Eccentric trephination, this will lead to a large amount of postoperative astigmatism. Damaged donor potum, retained decimus membrane, iris or lens damage, and this is a devastating complication, and you should take care during the surgery. Um, this might lead to expulsive hemorrhage, and the anterior chamber hemorrhage, especially in inflamed eyes. The non-technical complication, uh, because this is an open sky procedure, so uh, expulsive choroidal hemorrhage is one of the worst complications if it happens, and luckily it's an uh, rare. Uh, uh, but you should know how to manage this devastating complication. Predisposing factors for that is an advanced age, myopia, glaucoma, inflammation, hypotony, short neck opacity, and as I told you, this is an devastating complication. What about the early postoperative complications? It's a long list, as you can see, wound leak, persistent corneal defect, filamentary keratitis, elevated IUP, severe inflammation, anterior segment, uh, anterior, uh, anterior sinica formation, pupillary block, choroidal detachment, high femur, fixed dilated pupil, infectious keratitis, endophthalmitis primary, donor failure. I will not talk about each one. Uh, from the practical point of view, we need to know how to manage, especially for the uh, fellows, how to manage the wound leak. Uh, you can discover the wound leak by low intracranial pressure second day uh, or anterior segment depth will give you a hint, side delta is positive or negative. Regarding the management, we need to go for immediate intervention if there is an a flat EC, suture track leak, or iris prolapse. But if the AC is formed and minimal leak, we can try bandage contact lens, pressure patch, or, and equisuppressant. Uh, if uh, non-surgical attempts for the medical part fail to seal the leak after 24 hours to 48 hours, surgical repair is recommended. Regarding the late complication of post-operative, uh, of post-PKP, uh, can be corneal allograft rejection, graft infection, retrocorneal membranes, and glaucoma. Also here I will talk the, about the most common complication which we are seeing and facing in the clinic and emergency room, which is an, uh, a graft rejection. The corneal transplantation is the most successful tissue transplantation procedure in human. So increased success is due to improved surgical techniques, better donor management, and appreciation of the varied clinical manifestation, as well as uh, improved the medical treatment uh, uh, by using uh, corticosteroid therapy. Regarding how the hysterical perceptive allograft rejection started in 1948 by, uh, by, by Pfico, was the first described graft failure as an opacification of the corneal graft, and he specula they speculate that host sensitivity to the donor was the cause. Mumuni, in 1951, he confirms in the lab study that sensitization of the host to the donor was the underlying basis of the, this graft failure. And also, he is in 1960 emphasized the importance of the endothelium as the cell damage by the immunological assault. For this reason, we are preferring lamellar keratoplasty over the penetrating keratoplasty because we are saving the endothelium uh, of the patient. Uh, the risk factors for the graft rejections, and this is very important, younger patients. So we are trying to not go for penetrating keratoplasty in younger patients especially if they have another associated diseases. Uh, corneal vascularization, mainly stroma, large diameter grafts, and this is you are seeing it in tectonic and therapeutic uh, grafts because the closure to the uh, limbus and limbal vasculature. 
Uh, peripheral anterior cyanica and iridocorneal touch lose sutures because attracting blood vessels, prior graft failure, that means indicate the rejection rate in the other graft is more higher and pre-existing inflammation. The symptoms uh, of the graft rejection uh, started by redness, blurring of vision, light sensitivity, discomfort in the eye that lasts longer than a few hours and not relieving by uh, uh, lubricants. These symptoms should require the patient to go to the emergency to be evaluated. Signs of the graft rejection, ciliary flush, and this is the early signs, AC flare, AC reaction, sub-epithelial infiltrates, keratic precipitates, graft edema, and increased corneal thickness. Regarding the types of the graft rejection could be epithelial rejection and this is we are not seeing it commonly because the epithelium usually is replaced quickly and usually it comes in form of sub-epithelial infiltrate like lesions. Stroma rejection is uh, cellular, uh, cellular infiltrates at the level of the stroma can be mild and can be severe to the level of total stroma necrosis. Endothelial rejection, this is the commonest type, uh, usually affecting the endothelium. You will find keratic precipitates. You might find the specific one, which is an hodadost line, which is an lymphocyte infiltration at the level of the endothelium. This is it's an, a sub-epithelial infiltrates like picture we are seeing it in epithelial uh, rejection. This is corneal edema or graft edema uh, plus uh, it's not that much clear but there is an KBs and thickened co uh, cornea. This is the Khoda dust line if you can see and this is an keratic precipitates plus the corneal edema. Uh, and usually associated with the anterior chamber reaction. This is another uh, picture of Hodelist line. And this is keratic precipitates. Hodelist line is an Iranian um, ophthalmologist consultant. He's, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, he, his, he has his own foundation uh, and uh, he's born in 1935 and still alive. I like his word, he said, never tell a human being that he's blind. If a man's eyesight is dead, you should light his rays of hope and live in his soul. Regarding the management of the graft rejection, fortunately, most episodes of the corneal allograft rejection reaction can be reserved if therapy is initiated early and aggressively. For this reason, those patients should endorse to the emergency once there is an abnormal, and we should counsel the patients regarding this. Corticosteroid uh, therapy is the main st uh, state of treatment, mainly topical, but periocular can be uh, used, or systemic even, in high-risk cases. Topical preparation found to be a superior over subconjunctival injection as well as systemic administration, especially for uh, uh, short-term course. In high-risk cases or recurrent um, uh, attacks of rejection, we can go for oral immunosuppressive therapy like cyclosporine, tacrolimus, mycophenolate, mofetil, and this is uh, improving the graft survival rate. Uh, topical cyclosporin uh, or tacrolimus is an, of great help uh, as an steroid uh, sparing uh, topical agents, especially for those patients with the steroid uh, induced glaucoma. Uh, now we'll talk briefly about the graft infection. The incidence varies from 1.7 to 12%. Most cases of microbial keratitis after penetrating keratoplasty present within the first postoperative year. Is an causes for microbial keratitis immediately after penetrating keratoblasty, and this is related to the contaminated donor bottom, intraoperative contamination, and recurrence of the host infection. The late postoperative period microbial keratitis is usually due to the acquired infection. The predisposing factors for the microbial keratitis uh, after penetrating keratoblasty could be related to sutures, corneal epithelial defect. Uh, bandage contact lens use, 
history of herpetic keratitis, topical corticosteroids, ocular surface disorders, and eye and ocular adenexal abnormality. And you can see this is a huge microbial keratitis over the graft. This is another uh, severe microbial keratitis with thinning, hypopian, and endophthalmitis. Uh, and this is an infectious crystalline keratopathy. I didn't talk about the management because all this is needs a detailed uh, 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 talk, and, but the, usually the treatment will be um, similar to how to treat a microbial keratitis in the emergency in any situation, but those patients need close observation. I'll talk now about the lamellar keratoplasty. It's a technique where diseased corneal stroma is selectively replaced with the donor stromal tissue while preserving the host decimates membrane and the endothelium. Uh, this is a short video. Just. Here, if you, as you can see, we are doing a lamellar dissection or trephination. We are not going for full penetration uh, like in penetrating keratoplasty. Then we'll take the, uh, doing a uh, uh, stromal dissection to take the diseased uh, cornea of the host, either scar or keratoconus. Then after that, uh, uh, we'll, there is a lot of techniques, either stromal, uh, this is an air bubble technique, uh, which is uh, created by uh, Dr. Muhammad Anwar uh, to separate the deep uh, stroma from, uh, from the decimates membrane. And there is another technique, uh, Mellis techniques, uh, and hydro delamination, there is a uh, stromal dissection. So uh, it's a lot of techniques, but the, uh, the conclusion, it's an lamellar keratoplasty. Then after that, we remove the endothelium from the donor, patient, uh, donor uh, cornea, as you can see here. And after that, we will suture the donor graft to the recipient host. Uh, the lamellar keratoplasty can be superficial or can be deep uh, for the pathology. Uh, the most common uh, indication is keratoplasty, so we try to make it deep as much as we can. The rejection rate almost negligible compared to penetrating keratoplasty. As I told you, many techniques can be used. This is another photos of uh, lamellar keratoplasty. The indication, lamellar keratoplasty is indicated in eyes with a stromal opacification with a normal endothelial function and absence of the breaks or scars in the decimates membrane. Keratoconus with no history of acute hydrobes is one of the indication. Keratoconus with a superficial to moderate depth corneal scar, superficial stromal dystrophies and degenerations, superficial corneal scars. There is a special circumstances we need to go for lamellar keratoplasty and to avoid the penetrating keratoplasty as much as we can. And those keratoconus associated with the inflammation like fernal keratoconjunctivitis where the PKB is relatively contraindicated Keratoconus in Down syndrome cases due to the risk of trauma, other eyes has, or if the other eye has had repeated graft rejections, or if the patient's monocular where there is an increased risk of trauma, corneal disease with the concomitant limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, in such cases, even we are not trying to do a uh, big bubble technique because big bubble techniques has its percentage of failures. We are going directly to the lamellar dissection in a state. The intraoperative complication of lamellar keratoplasty, the most common complication is an perforation of the decimates membrane. 
and the most it can happen all stage in all stage during the surgery but the most common uh, um, steps could be during trephination stromal dissection during big bubble technique or suture uh, needles risks may increase the incidence of dismiss perforation like deep corneal scar previous corneal surgery very advanced keratoconus or learning curve the management the very important thing is to avoid it as much as you can and you need to observe once meticulous observation once it happens to manage it immediately other to keep it for uh, uh, second day this is dependent on the size of the perforation is it micro perforation or large or macro perforation where is the location is it inferior superior the most uh, uh, way to treat it is to inject anterior uh, air in the anterior chamber during the surgery to seal the dissimus membrane to the uh, uh, donor stroma during the suturing and to keep the air uh, for a few days. Sometimes you are using fibrin glue, especially if the location of the perforation inferior because the air with the gravity will go up. So uh, we might use fibrin glue and give good uh, results. Histoacrylic glue is, was tried um, but actually it has its own risk of attracting uh, the blood vessels and it might worsen the situation. So it's better to avoid it. The post-operative complication also related to the uh, dissimits membrane perforation. That means if there is no dissimits membrane perforation, the complication is very minimal and very unlikely after. So the anterior chamber, uh, erythropoiesis syndrome and papillary block. Uh, so the anterior chamber that means there is a separation as you can see here. This is the patient dissimits membrane and this is the donor. There is a separation. They call it double anterior chamber. There is an uh, either fluid or uh, 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 viscoelastic material in this. For this reason, and this is as you can, there is a uh, viscoelastic material here. In such cases, you need to inject air in the anterior chamber to seal the dissimits the dissimits membrane to the donor cornea. Sometimes you need to do it many times, or you need long acting uh, gas like SF6 or C3F8. Um, if many uh, attempts fail, you might need to go to uh, either revise it or to go for full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, all step or all uh, complication, it has another complication like for example with such injection of the air in the anterior chamber you might go for arytzephalia syndrome. Arytzephalia syndrome is an fixed and dilated pupil following penetrating keratoplasty or following any procedure lead to high intraocular pressure. The possible risk factors uh, increase intraocular pressure during or after surgery, the use of atropine or any mediatic agents, the presence of viscoelastic material left in the anterior chamber or anterior chamber inflammation reaction uh, in the post-operative period. And all these can lead to uh, ischemia of the uh, iris sphincter and this will lead to fixed dilated pupil followed by iris atrophy, anterior subcapsular cataract uh, and uh, another uh, complications. And management is uh, uh, usually, um, it can be complete or incomplete. If it's incomplete, you, uh, we can try the uh, constricting uh, drops immediately post-operatively on post once we see the um, uh, complication and uh, the re it can be reversible but if it is permanent and irreversible that means you need to go for surgical option uh, of the patient uh, start to complain uh, of symptoms because of uh, no time I have an iris circulage we did it for this patient but there is no time and you have still uh, we need to talk about another procedures 
Endothelial keratoplasty is the treatment of choice for any patient with the endothelial dysfunction that has been visually disabling because it's safer and provide faster visual recovery than the alternative for thickness penetrating keratoplasty. The type of endothelial keratoplasty is many types. The most common types is disemistripping endothelial keratoplasty, uh, which uh, is uh, replacing the uh, decimates membrane and the endothelium uh, of the patient by a decimates membrane endothelium plus stroma, posterior stroma of the donor, but uh, they are using a manual dissection instead of automated one. The most common one is the decimistripping automated endothelial dystrophy, DASIC, using a microkeratoma or femtosecond assisted uh, machine. Nowadays, uh, the ultra thin DASIC become popular and we are trying to make it very thin uh, uh, DASIC lenticule to allow and reduce the complication and allow attachment. Decimates membrane endothelial keratoblastic demic, which is there is no stroma with it. So the DASIC is a donor corneal endothelium is transplanted in a carrier consisting of decimates membrane and the posterior corneal stroma. DEMIC is the donor corneal endothelium is transplanted without the carrier of the decimates membrane and stroma. And if you can see, this is an, a DASIC lenticule and they, uh, it's an, a posterior uh, lamellar keratoblastic procedure. And this is an endemic, only decimates membrane and the endothelium. Indication for endothelial keratoblasty for any causes uh, 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 causing an endothelial dysfunction. Fox endothelial dystrophy, posterior polymorphous dystrophy, CHID, posterior uh, sudificic uh, polus keratopathy, epicic polus keratopathy, eye syndrome, endothelial decompensation from trauma or glaucoma previous surgery, failed penetrating keratoplasty. The complication, uh, the intraoperative complication of endothelial keratoplasty could be related to damaged donor tissue, eccentric trephination, retained disseminate membrane. This is very important practically. Sometimes in cases of CHID or posterior polymorphous dystrophy, it is difficult to remove the whole endothelium and decimates membrane uh, during uh, trephination of the patient. So there is a lot of tags will be found later, and this will at, uh, prevent the attachment of the daisy lenticule even with the injection of air, and this is, will increase the risk of uh, uh, daisy lenticule detachment following days. Upside down positioning of the graft, or unfolding difficulty, especially in ultra-thin DASIC and DEMIC. The most operative complication, the most important one is the donor uh, dislocation, and this is the most common complication. And Mark Theory uh, study, it's about 1.5%, but in the literature up to 23%, and can be avoided or reduced by following. And practically, you can see it during the DASIC procedure, we are doing corneal surface massaging. This is to try to evacuate every uh, fluid in the interface. Fenting procedure, we are making an holes opening in the anterior stroma to allow the, uh, uh, the fluid to come out, but this has a risk of, uh, of epithelial ingrowth, and nowadays we are not using it. Uh, stromal roughening, and this is during the removal of the um, uh, decimates membrane of the patient. You need to rough and rub the, the strom of the patient to make or to create a bit inflammation, and this it might help in attachment. Factors uh, lead to the donor dislocation, as we said, an interface fluid, retained decimates membrane, especially if there is a tags mechanical trauma to the lenticule during insertion or while removing the air bubble, residual viscoelastic in the graft host interface. The post-operative complications um, uh, also can be a primary graft failure, 
graft rejection which is less frequent and less severe compared to the penetrating keratoplasty. Bevere block glaucoma and this most probably related to the air injection. Endothelial loss is from 31 to 50% of the first six month post-op with no further significant change uh, after that. For this reason, you need to select good uh, tissue with a good endothelial uh, cell, count, cell count more than 2,000 or even prefer more than 2,500. The refractive change is minimal, usually hyperopia, usually to not affect the astigmatism or keratometry uh, reading of the graft uh, of the cornea. So this is you need to take it in consideration if you are going to go for a triple procedure and to do cataract surgery at the same time to overcome the hyperobic shift. Supracoroidal hemorrhage is rare, retinal detachment is rare, and cystoid macular edema. The last procedure we'll talk about today is an keratoprosthesis. It's an surgical procedure where a diseased cornea is replaced with an artificial cornea. The types, there is a lot of types, there are a lot of types, but the most common types are the osteoodontokeratoprosthesis, alpha core artificial cornea, and Boston keratoprosthesis. And this is an permanent keratoprosthesis. We have also an temporary keratoprosthesis. We are using it uh, in the operating room if there is an retinal uh, disease need surgery, but the media of the cornea is not allowing, so we are doing a temporary keratoprosis, then we replace it by the graft, I mean normal tissue, I mean graft tissue. Uh, the, I will not talk about the, I will talk about the Boston actually, keratoprosis is the commonest one we are using it, so just brief about the osteoidentic keratoprosis, they call it tooth in the eye surgery, and this is, needs multiple uh, subspeciality and special centers for that. Uh, we are not doing it here. Alpha core artificial uh, cornea, it's an also, um, uh, uh, it has its limitation because of its high risk of complications, so it's not used commonly. The Boston keratoprosthesis, is, this is the most common we are using it. It's an color bottom design keratoprosthesis or uh, artificial uh, uh, cornea. It consists of three component parts, if, as you can see. Front plate, which has the power, if, they, if it is uh, ephicic. And uh, back plate and locking ring. This is, will be assembled in the donor cornea, uh, corneal graft, and will be replacing the host diseased cornea. This is a uh, short video about it, and it's uh, important to see it. Uh, the important thing on Boston keratoprosthesis procedure is how to center and to do the assembly uh, very meticulously because uh, the rest of the procedure is actually like a penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, as I told you, it has two uh, types, either pseudophicic type or uh, thick type, I mean, regarding the power, uh, and you need to do uh, IL calculation uh, regular because the case here is a standard K44, but uh, you need the axial length. And if there is, uh, if the patient is thick, you need to go to put an a power on the optical part. This is uh, for the residents, uh, similar like a uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Penetrating keratoplasty, you are taking the full thickness of the diseased 
cornea of the patient and we're replacing it by a full thickness penetrating graft. It's already in this video, it's assembled the front plate and the back plate. And this is the optical part. And just you will suture it. So uh, the posting keratoprosis is available in two types, type 1 and type 2 formats. The type 1 design uh, is used much more frequently than the type 2, which is reserved for, I mean the type 2 reserved for the end stage dry eye conditions and is similar to the type 1 except it has a 2 millimeter anterior nub assigned to penetrate, uh, to penetrate through the tarsorophy. Type 1 keratoprosis is available in a single, as I told you, in a single standard sodificic pore or customized efficic optic with an 8.5 millimeter diameter adult size or 7 millimeter diameter pediatric size backplate. The indications for Boston keratoprosis uh, uh, is uh, it's an, a treatment option for the corneal disorders not amenable to standard penetrating keratoplasty. In the literature, you find it for repeat graft failure, herpetic keratitis, aniridia, many pediatric congenital corneal opacities includes Peter's anomaly, psychiatrizing conditions like Stephen Johnson syndrome or ocular psychiatrized benfigoid or ocular burn. Most probably we are using it for the repeat graft failure with the fair outcome and on psychiatrizing uh, type with guarded uh, outcome. This is a prognostic categories with the post in uh, keratoprosis 2009. Uh, it has an, a guard prognosis in Stephen Johnson syndrome, mucous membrane, pemphigoid, uveitis, lobus, rheumatoid arthritis, because the risk of melting is high, uh, and has an affair uh, outcome on the chemical burns or corneal allograft rejections repeat uh, graft uh, failures, aniridia. It has good outcome post-traumatic, post-infectious causes, corneal degeneration and corneal dystrophies. Complication, it's, there's a lot of complication uh, to this procedure in, uh, including uh, retro uh, prosthetic membrane. And this is the most common Treatable cause, uh, you see it after uh, Boston keratoprosthesis. The retro prosthetic membrane usually it happens in most of the cases, so you need to observe it early. Once you observe it early, you can treat it safely uh, in the clinic by YAG laser. But if it's left for longer time, it will be thick and difficult to be uh, uh, removed by YAG, so you need to go uh, to take it surgically, which is uh, it might worsen the situation. Elevated intracapricial glaucoma, this is almost in all cases also, so in such uh, procedure, you need to combine the keratoprosis by a glaucoma surgery usually like either tu uh, tube devices or uh, uh, CBC or ECP. Problem here, and you, cannot con you cannot measure the IUP by uh, a machine. So you need to use your uh, tingling sensation for that. Uh, so eventually the glaucoma will happen later on. So uh, the best is to go for uh, uh, concomitant surgery, glaucoma surgery with the keratoprosthesis. Graft melting, uh, also common 
uh, and you need uh, and such procedure needs and a meticulous follow-up and close observation. Infectious endophthalmitis, sterile phytritis, retained detachment, which is rare and vitreous hemorrhage. Regarding the post-operative management, this is very important, very important A slide. Indefinite placement of bandage contact lens is needed to maintain adequate ocular surface hydration and prevent stromal melt, deformation, tissue melt, and necrosis. Indefinite daily topical antibiotic prophylaxis. And this is very important. Lifelong topical steroid, close follow-up with an ophthalmologist to monitor for complication associated with the device. As I told you, it, every procedure, it needs one hour to talk. I try to cover as much as I could see it's an important and practical point. Thank you so much. Any question? Uh, this is a good uh, question. Uh, the recommendation is to go for even fortified vancomycin as a recommendation by the literature. It's to prevent and uh, to make sure there is no infection. Uh, or you need, I mean, a stronger uh, antibiotic. Uh, actually, in practical uh, point, we are using the fourth uh, generation coenophilolones like uh, Figamox or Zymer. Uh, twice or three times a daily. Uh, you need some people, they need to change it to prevent resistance. So you need to change it to another uh, uh, antibiotic from time to time. The important thing, such patient, because of the uh, colony, uh, the normal flora in the eye, and the risk of melting and dryness in such cases, you need to give them bolus doses every three uh, uh, to six months for short period of anti-fungal uh, uh, like uh, amphotericin and uh, fortified antibiotics uh, like fortified fancomycin if you are not using it for uh, two to three weeks as an uh, loading dose then you continue in uh, another uh, uh, light uh, antibiotics. Uh, we can hear the um, uh, there is any add, uh, Prof. Khalid, regarding the antibiotics? Thank you for your nice presentation. Um, the long-term use of uh, antibiotics may carry the risk of having resistant uh, organisms, uh, and uh, one has to consider changing the antimicrobial agent every now and then uh, for the prophylactic period. Uh, I don't like to hear the word uh, uh, long-term prophylaxis because prophylaxis by definition should be just for a short period during uh, a procedure. But long-term use of the antibiotics may carry the risk of uh, resistant strains of organisms. Okay. Okay, uh, regarding the topical steroid, because you put the optical uh, part on a tissue, you cannot put it just directly and you suture it, you will put it in a graft. So you need uh, uh, the uh, steroid for the graft itself, because if it melts, I mean, if it's uh, failed and there is a recurrent CD at the um, uh, corneal tissue part, it might melt, it might cause infection, and so you need to maintain it clear as much as you can for lifelong. Regarding the, um, uh, the glaucoma part, the only way is in a digital checking for IOB. There is no machine, no ablination, no tonometry can check the pressure. So it's very important. Usually, such cases will end by damaged angle. So they will end eventually by glaucoma. 
for such case for such reason you need to combine them by either tube surgery or uh, laser surgery so you need to talk to the glaucoma team for that I mention it. Uh, uh, it can be given as an loading dose for two to three weeks, every three to six months. You need to follow the the ideal way is to follow up patients every month, but it's not easy. So you should follow patients from one to three months and regular basis lifelong. And you should tell the patient. This is a procedure needs long um, lifelong uh, uh, follow up, and you should choose the patient. Sometimes the patient is not around the city; he is far. Socioeconomic status very important, such but sometimes you, you should not do it because of the complication. Thank you, Dr. Musa. Okay. This is very nice presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the size of the keratoprosthesis compared to the recipient. Do you choose the same size? Uh, actually, it's 0.5 millimeter difference, like in a standard case. Bigger? Uh, yeah, uh, bigger, yes. And usually we are using a, a child size for the adult. We found that uh, once you take the 8.5 millimeter uh, uh, posterior plate, that means you need nine millimeter and you'll end up by large graft and a lot of complication. So practically we are using seven millimeter child size for the adult and it works well. Uh, thank you for Shang, excellent presentation. Uh, let me add something regarding the, the treatment for keratoprosthesis. Uh, after years of working in Boston, uh, Dr. Dolman and Roberto Pineda came with a protocol for the treatment. Um, as we know, the treatment in antibiotics have to be for a long time. If we use high doses, we will change the flora and we will predispose the patient for additional infections, and for fungal. Uh, the treatment right now is divided in two. For patients that are, that have an immunological reason, are for no immunological reasons. The patients for immunological reasons are the Pemphigo, Steven Johnson's arthritis. Those patients have to be treated different than the other ones. And so the protocol is for uh, immunological patients will be the uh, it will be the use of the polytrin, which is uh, trimetropine and polymyxin. Uh, you can combine that one with vancomycin. The vancomycin have something very particular. You cannot use the dose that we use for regular uh, treatment for keratitis, which is 50 milligrams a day. The dose for keratoprosthesis is different. It has to be 14 milligrams per ml. And the first combination is with the polytrim. The second combination is, as you say, is fluoroquinolones. And fluoroquinolone for immunological patients has to be fluoroquinolone combined either with vancomycin or either with uh, chloramphenicol. The dose is one drop twice a day for each one of these ones. For the other group of patients with no uh, immunological comprise, compromises, you have to use almost the same. The first option is the polytrim. The second option will be a fluoroquinolone for generation combined with chloramphenicol. And the third option will be the combination of fluoroquinolone with the vancomycin. Uh, the other one, as you say, for the fungal, uh, every three months we have to give uh, one week of uh, dose, which will be one drop twice a day, either of uh, Amphoterin CB, or the other one with the natimycin. Okay? Twice a day for one week every three months. Thank you. Thank you. Is Dr. Osirio here? 
uh, with the protocol in uh, Paracare regarding the Boston, regarding the antibiotics. The, proto the protocol in Barraqueri is the same as explained Dr. Vargas. We follow the same protocol because it's a worldwide protocol. So we don't have any special protocol. The, some patients, the no immunology patient, we manage the patient sometimes with only one antibiotic, quinolones especially. In, uh, in Europe, we have experience with bigamox. We don't have a special uh, experience with gatifloxacin. Then we use in non immunology patients with bigamox twice a day for a long time. The, there are other indications, there are other uh, recommendations of the protocol is the use of povidon. In each visit, you, you must remove the bandage content lens and put one drop of povidone. And after that, replace the bandage content lens. The use of povidone reduce the, the amount of, 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 of bacterial, uh, of bacteria in the ocular surface, and even reduce the, the risk of uh, fungal keratitis. So that the only, sh the, the only difference with the protocol is the use of povidone in after each visit. But the protocol is the same, it's, worldwide, it's a worldwide protocol. Thank you so much. And this is very important. I didn't mention it, that we need to change the lens in every visit. It's very important. Thank you, Dr. Mosa, for a, for a great talk and, and overview of keratoplasty. You know, the, the things for which we have less data for, we become more passionate about. So those things that we don't know exactly what's the right protocol, we could spend the next hour discussing, you know, prophylaxis and those sort of things. But I actually want to go back to the more boring topic, which is what our residents and fellows see on call much more often which is the, the post-keratoplasty patients with infections um, and other complications. And so I wonder if you could sort of give the, the residents and fellows a, a 30 second capsule for what they should tell their patients regarding when to come to the ER, what to look out for. Because I think sometimes we, we give them a great surgery and we're very proud of ourselves and then they go home and then they come in two months later and they've had a red eye for two weeks and pain and, and we wonder, why didn't you come in? You know, wh what would you sort of tell the fellows, you know, what do they need to tell our patients? What's our education goal? What would you pass on to them to help, to help these patients take get better care of themselves? Great, uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you all.